was a struggle, had to make it out the jungle. This is a show for you. Welcome to the hustle. Under pressure, never break a foe. Keep chasing your goals until you blow down. Welcome to the hustle. Welcome, everybody. We're back to another episode of the Hustle Podcast. It's your man, Steve. We got Tech and Tally in the building. Yes, sir. And hey. we got another very special guest today, Jesse Jordan Bell. How's it going, man? It's going very well. I don't know about special, though. Thank you for the great intro. He's pretty, he's pretty special. He, I, heard, I heard a lot of things. Uh, Tech has been telling us a lot of great things about you, and uh, we're very excited to interview, to interview you today. Awesome. I'm interested to know what's uh, what's up. What yeah, are, what man. Uh, basically, listen, man. Uh, if 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 I could do sort of a an introduction for the viewers and listeners, I mean, this guy was throwing some of the most tremendous private party weed events. I, I went to one of them uh, in NDG at the Crowley Center. Fire! I don't think I've ever been as high in my life. It was it was it was tremendous. We'll talk about that. Um, he he's an advocate for physical fitness. He's an avid jujitsu trainer. He's the guy behind Dabernak, formerly known or maybe still known as Justin True Dope. <laughs> yeah. That's true dope, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we got a lot of ground to cover today. Very interesting guests, and we we listen. Let's just let's let's get into it. First of all, um, I know COVID, and I know we're, we're, we're we'll call it the pandemic. Exactly. We gotta we gotta take it easy on what we talk. Yeah, about yeah. No, we're here. not gonna go down no <laughs> rabbit holes. But what I'm saying is that it's it's put kind of a stop into a lot of the things that you were working on prior to the world shutting down. Um, I guess let's just start there and talk about, you know, what you had going on prior to and, and how you can kind of come out of this and, and rebuild. Yeah, uh, the pandy definitely affected my, uh, my business with Dabernak. Dabernak was an events company, so what we were doing was throwing, like, yeah, like on the East Coast, the largest, highest quality cannabis-themed events. And, uh, I mean, we got up to, like... 800 p guests in a party let's yeah. say it was lit it was so lit bro it was and so then we lit. would throw like workshops with like you know 30 40 people at a time so as you can imagine um this threw a wrench in that we couldn't plan any events over the past two years so i just uh put a little stop to it and uh refocused rebranding trying to figure out where to what to do with Dabernak in the meantime before we're allowed to come back and uh celebrate again with all our friends yeah we miss everybody i'll be there Cool. I, will be there, man. <laughs> I, I gotta come check it out too man yeah you would love it you would love it there was like a full chocolate fountain at the one i went to there was yeah Ki yeah I'll, I'll, I'll break it down let's see what what we've done so like we had uh let's say we had like a halloween party one year where we had like um obviously like everybody dressed up trying to win you know the best bong prize and things like that everything was themed uh with like jack-o-lanterns and this sort of stuff and uh then we had like a christmas party where we had like a santa uh what was what did we call them uh santa not claus uh anyways it was like santa it was a, it was a santa claus in green and he was just giving out free gifts to everybody out of his bag and we had like the 12 giveaways of dabernak and uh you know like the like a partridge in a pear tree they were trying to like build a dabrig out of a pear as fast as they can and, and dab through it to win a prize right so we had, and then next we had like, ex, uh, we had like, the, I wanted to bring a taco sesh to Canada. So we had the biggest taco sesh called Cannaval where we just had a mariachi Sounds band. Delicious. And yeah, we had ch the medicated nacho cheese and uh, fountains and like he said, distillate infused THC uh, uh, chocolate fountains. We had like cotton candy that was infused machines. We had, uh, again, games and all that stuff that were themed for Cinco Dab Mile, we called it. <laughs> and uh, that went down really well. That was super fun. We had a Trump pinata. We had a <laughs> big weed amazing. pinatas. We broke it. Everyone rushed in, took all the weed products inside them. So good times there. Then we had Extract 67, which was a Montreal theme party. It was just like trying to give love to everything Montreal. Super fun. It was um, themed after uh, Expo 67, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was our best party for sure. That was my favorite one. After that, we did a workshop with uh, Frenchie Cannoli on 420. Then we, who's a, f a famous hash maker, and then we did um, a, a, what is it? Sugar Shack. We did a Sugar Shack sesh. So everybody, we just smoked out yeah. a big Sugar Shack and I ate all that food and had like infused the uh, syrup and shit, syrup yeah. and all that. Yeah. So yeah, we just have a good time. We're we're always trying to teach people about cannabis while having the best time possible and give them fun stuff yeah and it's listen again the events are top notch i listen like i literally got so high i had to leave i was like listen i was, I was with my, my baby mom at the time and i said look listen 
We gotta go. We I gotta go home. I was like, I'm, I'm out of here. I was I was hitting drink the some dab. Milk. <laughs> I but I bought a bunch of like designer weed at the time. They had like stra- strains that like were, were not out at least you know my plugs in the city yet. So I was I left there really happy. I got a free flight pen out of it. So I was I was happy. It was it was let, great. Let me say this. We actually made a Vice document. Vice came into our event and made a documentary which went on Tele Quebec about our events, right? And it was very controversial because we had markets. What we were doing was trying to uh, fight for legalization by pushing the boundaries and pushing the authorities and saying, like, we're going to keep doing this until you legalize it as soon as possible. So uh, that went, like, pretty viral. That, like, went all of Quebec for three years was watching Justin Trudeau explain that he's doing this. I remember those videos. I remember hearing Justin Trudeau all over it. That's it. So, I mean, that's that's a game changer, too, you know, because that's like not hidden anymore. That's not a secret anymore. That's like we're doing this. What are you going to do about it? So um, that's part of the story as well. Just to throw that in there. So no, for knows. sure. And it's, it's funny because last time I interviewed you was when I was doing the radio show. This must have been three, four years ago. Um, we were just on the cusp of legalization. And I remember having a conversation with you and you being right about everything that we talked about in regards to legalization and like, you know, the government sort of coming in and and creating a total monopoly on it in terms of the sale and distribution. Um, And, you know, I know you've been frontlining definitely on on that side of the industry as well. Um, Has anything changed in regards to that? Like is is are there going to be sort of private markets able to open up in Quebec, like kind of how we see out west, you know, where where you can like privately own a dispensary? Is, Is that coming at all? So, no. It's not coming. Um, And that's why I was so outspoken about it early on, because I knew what was coming. I was always uh, preaching decriminalization because I know if you're going to if you're going to be a government that wants to control anything, you're inevitably going to cause people to be corrupt to get around the system. Mm. Black markets. So, yeah. So you're encouraging the black market to get crazier or get more volatile while you're stealing this 40 years of industry everyone built for you. Right. And, and that's what happened. We got left with nothing. Nobody can go open their own dispensary and do anything without insane amounts of paperwork that will never get looked at and hurdles you can't cross. So, no, it's not going to happen, and I'm furious about it. And, but things have changed. What's changed is there was a lot of optimism from the licensed producers early on, the legal growers, that they would make a robust industry for us. But because we are so regulated... It actually backfired, yeah. and now they're stuck, not able to do anything. They can't move their product. They they're can't really only in the medical it. sector on this end, right? Right. And actually, because they were so gung ho about recreational, they kind of put medical to the side, and now it's biting them in the ass because recreational, like you said, is monopolized by the SQDC, and if they can't open anything to compete with them, then that that market sort of shut down. So. I don't want to say too much, but what I will say is that the LPs are no longer cooperating. Um, they're, they're, they're black. They're gangster. They don't care about these rules, just like we didn't care all those years. Exactly. So what they're facing now is what we face during Prohibition, and they're going, you know what? We have this amazing company and corporation and these shareholders we all put, you know, we all lied to, essentially. We're going to do whatever it takes now, and that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Well, yeah, you can't be sitting on a 1,000 pounds of a product no. and it's not going anywhere. It's just no. going to get moldy and... Uh... Yeah. Well, not only that, it's not only the product itself, but it's the, the packaging that you invested in, the advertisement. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it that, that people don't necessarily think about. Um, I was actually in the, the licensing field, as we were talking about off air. Um, and I remember, you know, I won't mention the LP that I was working for, but I remember them literally having to rush to change all of their packaging within like a certain amount of time. And like the way it happened was the government just basically said, listen, you have say two months to change all of your packaging because they needed some sort of i can't remember exactly what it was there i think it was the um, the warning label or something like that they were missing like something that was exactly so it's like imagine being an lp and having thousands of pounds or product in in circulation that you now have to take back in and rebrand just the amount of money they lost on that alone it's like they're interfering with your hustle. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and look, I feel bad for them. This is the Hustle Podcast. I feel bad for anybody hustling out there, including my enemies, who are these licensed producers who came in and stole the industry. I, I feel terrible for them because, like, I wish I could work with them. I actually may work with them to try and help them because it is that dire of a situation. If they're willing to cooperate with us, if the government's not, then they're not my enemies. Right. Yeah. yeah you need more. You need the 
a strong team to go against these people and everybody has to unify everybody's got to hustle <laughs> like talking about this on the last episode is how like everyone's been so divided lately and it's like it's especially when it comes to the government it's so important to come together and to like rise above them because they're just doing shit to like make the rich richer the poor poor so it's like it's it's nice that you're saying you want to like talk to your enemies and work with them and help them you know grow properly and to avoid the government's you know i'm glad you said that a lot of people don't agree and that's been very weird over the especially these past two years is watching people acquiesce so easily or capitulate to government demands whatever the government says okay you know why they just comply They're people just... are afraid to go to jail man. although i will say that we are blessed to live where we live because it is you know yes any government in the world you know there's there's going to be the bad apples and, and the and the corruption going on you can't get around it any anytime you're dealing with trillions billions of dollars there's going to be hidden hands that are you know controlling things from the top level but again in canada we do have it a lot easier as average everyday citizens than even in the states to be honest with you um so we are kind of lucky to live where we live so shout out to you know i'm happy to be canadian I'll t i will tell you that especially being a father of two it's like there, there's a lot of stuff i don't have to worry about yeah. in terms of just you know uh, medicine education stuff like that we are a lot better off than mm -hmm. than our neighbors to look out that's that's 100 percent, yeah I have a, Canada, a hat right now on, on my head that says Canada. <laughs> so I'm not proud of my country, but I am Canadian. Yeah. Um, and I will do whatever it takes to try to make this place better. But we do have to remember that not even about past atrocities, there's current things happening that go against freedom. And if we're in the West, which Canada stands for freedom and equality and these sort of things, that is our identity. We're seeing things that don't fall in line with that. And I'm going to speak up about it's it. It's true. The, the 215 the problem is that the recently got People just got let discovered. it happen. You know, people are just letting it happen. They're, they're complying. They're closing their eyes. And they're just, you know, going with whatever the government says. So this is what we're going back on of, like, standing up to the government and going against what they're doing because you just can't trust them. They're, well, it's, that's a very libertarian thing to say. And most people aren't libertarian. Most people are either liberal or conservative. And they're stuck and they're divisive about it. And they... They trust their governments because their governments apparently represent their interests when they vote for them. As a libertarian, I don't trust any side. I don't trust any government. So I have to be extra careful with how I place my votes. I don't just do it blindly. Well, I'm, I'm actually glad you brought up the 215 as well, which for those of you who don't know was the with the bodies of the the Aboriginal children they found at the uh, the residential schools. And one thing that does get ignored in Canada for whatever reason is the treatment of Native people. Um, you know, obviously from the past, I mean, that's that goes without saying the whole residential school system. We're still feeling the effects, not we, but, you know, the Aboriginal people are still feeling the effects of that to this day. It is a generational um, there has been generational effects that are that are palliative if you go you know on any reserve basically in in the country um, but also there's reserves as we speak right now that don't have clean drinking water and we're supposed to be one of these champion you know uh, social democratic countries and we can't even provide clean water for communities that you know have been here for thousands of years it just there's a lot about it that doesn't make sense you know so, so I definitely can see why you take the stance that you take yeah, I, I'm glad you said that. I'm somebody who grew up, I actually have a, my great-grandmother was Ojibwe, full-blooded native, so it's in me a, a little bit. And I remember growing up in school, learning about residential schools. And it didn't hurt me as a native blood, it hurt me as a human. Yeah, just it's atrocious. Yeah, so I was very well aware that this happened in the past. And so when this stuff comes up in the news, it's not, it doesn't blindside me. It's just like, I know, and it hurts. Um, and yeah, I'm just glad that you brought it up because... Uh, yeah that is a part of our history we got to accept big that yeah. <laughs> big time i mean listen the, you know the whole colonization of this continent was made off of the backs of native americans and of course the blacks who were brought over for slavery down south and i mean that that actually did happen in canada too there is a misconception that slavery was not a thing in canada it was no it was here yeah. it was actually the japanese got it really bad here did they yeah the asians there was a lot of asian uh um racism in canada there's a long history there's even it. attacks well, even oh, yeah. till this day, unfortunately, it's just it's sad to see how much hate is in people's hearts, you yeah. know, and there's never going to be a common ground where people are just going to be like, OK, we're all human. We all have the same blood. We all share the same land. It'll ne we'll never get to that that common ground, unfortunately, because some people have a certain mindset. And it's just I've spoken about this on Instagram on my own like story and stuff. But like, I just find it sad that people don't 
have that like third eye to realize like we're all in this together we're all on this giant floating rock so like why not just love each other instead of hate and discriminate i don't get that this is getting deep so i'm yeah. I'm an optimist so i actually see the future is uh people will start washing away their own identities because i have what you're gonna have like eight different races in you at one point like you can't get offended by everything exactly yeah. true, right you just got to be i'm human now i don't have all these this baggage behind me because i'm not one or two things yeah. i mean i'm what i'm a I'm a Polish, Jewish, Gypsy, Native, Irish, uh, right? What else am I? Moldovan, right? These, just these things around the world. If I have a, a kid with somebody who's got four completely or eight different, we're, we're getting, we're in the, wa the weeds are too thick exactly. now. My kid yeah. doesn't know what they are. And that's where the hope comes is where a generation comes along and they're all just brown and they're all just like, yeah. we don't really see that it is anymore. coming. <laughs> but you know, you know what? I think that this whole cancel culture kind of overly sensitive woke movement as annoying as it can be for you know say for example for stand-up comedians or for censorship or, or or things of that nature as kind of annoying as it as it could be i do think that this is a necessary step in the progression into what is next which is going to be a fully integrated society in my opinion within the next i would say 25 to 50 years because yeah. even even my kids like like you said that's i mean like they're from all over the world like you know i'm i'm mostly european my baby mother is west indian so it's like my kids have a whole bunch of shit going on in there you know what i mean so it's I like i think it's uh, the world has evolved yeah. the world has evolved yeah. technology with technology with in every aspect in the sense that everybody is mixing races not, not a bad thing i really see that as a great thing for this world that says the ultra greek super no, no, no. greek <laughs> motherfucker <laughs> the greeks you know what i mean like it has to be that way that way there's so much unity in this world and that everybody is we all bleed the same blood at the end of the day i do want to say this i want to say that no matter where you're from in the world what the greeks did matters we have to remember that the west was built on greek a lot of greek ideas yeah so doesn't matter what color their I skin think, was. I think history <laughs> the matters. ideas are it's good. History. history does have an effect on everything that's happened over the years. And we're just at a certain era that everything is changing. Yeah, very everything fast. Changing. And quickly. But it's, it's, it's technological as well because the reason that this whole cancel culture woke movement exists is because social media has provided access to people who previously they never had a voice. If you look at marginalized people, from anywhere in the world really like you know before uh, how old would social media would you say it was maybe 10 15 years maybe Around, a little yeah. maybe a little bit Something older like but that. before that it's like you didn't have a voice no at two, all your two friends heard you now exactly. 45 the, the might world. see what you said yeah. <laughs> now it feels better so we're literally <laughs> forced to look in the mirror at what our society is how it was built out our history and confront it which is i think something that has never happened in human history at least not on this scale so it's kind of cool, to be honest with you. And I think this whole, again, this whole woke movement, cancel everybody, it's kind of annoying. It can be kind of annoying in, 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 the term of, like, in terms of censorship, but it's a necessary step, I think. I think it's, a nece it's necessary even to deter us from being like that. Yeah. It's like let it, showing us how it can be can turn ugly as well. And we have to like, kind of rein it back in. And remember, it's a balance, not just a free-for-all. Yeah, and I so think we're with, seeing the, that. with the social media, especially right now, everything is full transparent. Yeah. There's a, you, there's, you can't hide things anymore. Governments can't hide their atrocities anymore. Exactly. Why? Because everybody's posting it on YouTube. Everybody's posting it here and there. It's, it's very hard to, yeah, you can put out disinformation, but at the end of the day, there's, just, there's side A and there's side B. Before, there was only side A. Mm -hmm. Now you have multiple sides. Well, we all have high-resolution cameras in our hand at all times. Yeah. yeah. Not just that, like the younger generation like myself, we don't watch the news. We don't get on our couch and turn on the TV yeah. and watch whatever's happening on CTV. We see everything and get everything off our phones directly. That's how I heard about the, the children, you know, in the, mm -hmm. the reserve school or whatever. And... Um, Speaking on the cancel culture thing, now they're trying to cancel Canada Day because of what happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a good point. It's an, it's it's fucked up because I was reading the comments on the post and they're saying like, oh fuck you, we're not gonna cancel Canada Day. What the hell? I'm still Canadian. I have pride and shit. And it's like like you were saying, there's the there is it's annoying, but there's a reason behind it. So it's like yeah, they're trying to cancel Canada Day, but look at what happened, and like we're trying to take a stand into recognize and and um i'm losing my words here but trying to 
shed light on it. Shed light on what happened, you know? And we're not just going to turn a blind eye and, you know, it's, it's a deep thing that happened. It's not something to celebrate this year, you and know? It's not done yet either. They, they still haven't... Uh, Exactly. Searched all the residential No, well, listen, there. anybody who thinks that there's only 200, or I think the number now is 317 because they, they found more bodies at another school, but oh anybody who God. thinks that there's only 317, listen, this is something that went on. Like Look, this, this guys, is, tuberculosis know. ravaged Canada. Yeah, big time. It, these kids had no chance. Big time. They were stuck in, like, the middle of nowhere with no access to proper medication. The church thought it was in God's hands at the time. Yeah. They were dropping like flies. It's very sad. Not when When you're malnourished, you can't fight it. Yeah. Not to mention all the, the nasty things that the priests did to these kids. That yeah, oh, that's, that. that's separate. But when you look at, I mean, there was definitely murder going on for sure. But when you look at these mass graves, that's disease yeah. that hits and wipes out a bunch at a time, which is tragic. Yeah. Very tragic. That's crazy. Well, listen, let's lighten things up a little bit here because I feel like we went down the dark hole and it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm the pessimist at the table. I'll I'll take it on the chin. Pause. Um, <laughs> I, I hear you like jujitsu, man. Yeah. Let, 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 let's that. get into the physical, uh, the physical fitness aspect. I got some questions for you as well, because I'm a believe it or not, guys. You know, I'm, I'm back on my fitness kick. I know it doesn't look like it. Give me, you know, give, you're going to see me progressively get smaller as the episodes continue. It looks like you lost a bit of weight. I lo- I'm seven pounds I think down. your ass found it, I'm though, seven but pounds. you no, lost def- a little def- bit of weight. That's, it's light humor. It's okay. We bicker back and forth. <laughs> but, uh, but, but Jesse, no, uh, he's definitely an advocate for physical fitness. I mean, your, your Instagram is full of you doing these, what to me looks like these in- intense, difficult routines. Um, how how'd you get on your, your journey into like physical fitness? Obviously, you do the jujitsu as well. How did that start? Young, young Jesse Jordan Bell, you know, as a teenager growing up, how does he decide that this is the path he wants to go down? I'm happy to ask because it's, it's not what you think it is. I'm, I was very lazy. I am lazy. You know, I just smoked weed throughout high school and, you know, played basketball a bit. I wasn't into fitness. I wasn't. I still am not even, a, you would say, like a, a fitness enthusiast or influencer or trying to get all shredded or any of these things, you know. What ended up happening was I had a girlfriend and uh, of like seven years out of high school and we broke up and you start or you're going to I just started feeling bad about myself. You know, like I don't what look at me, you know, heartbreak will do that. Exactly. Heartbreak will do that. So I remember being a huge stand up comedian fan and I was a Joe Rogan fan. And then Joe Rogan's best friend was Eddie Bravo and Eddie Bravo owns 10th Planet. And just somehow through me wanting to get into shape by doing a martial art rather than going to the gym and hearing about Eddie Bravo or Joe's friend say, this is great stuff, try it out. I like Googled it and there are just, by my luck happened to be one in Montreal. So it inspired me to go and fell in love right away because I got beat up and I couldn't imagine that, that that's possible so easily. So I got addicted. And next thing you know, you, everything you, over the years, you don't change right away. You're still a lazy piece of shit uh, when you get into something. It takes quite a long time for discipline to get into your like neuro pathways. Yeah. And once you start seeing changes that you enjoy, and I'm not talking about like physical fitness changes, but just progress in your technique, for example, like, oh my God, today I didn't get choked. Right. This motivates you to want to show up tomorrow and keep that progress going, not set it back by partying tonight, let's say. So you just, it's just a natural progression of, this next meal I'm going to have, is it going to make me better at jujitsu tomorrow or is it going to hurt me and I'm going to feel like shit tomorrow? And then you're just like, I'm not going to eat that. I'll eat this instead. That's the reward, Mm -hmm. right? Not the dopamine hit of the flavor of the food in the moment. You'd rather sacrifice for something greater in the long term. Exactly. And, uh, and you just start doing that little by little until suddenly it's like a lifestyle. You're just training yourself to be ultra disciplined in anything that approaches you. And uh, then you're like, I got to compliment my jujitsu because this isn't going to get me stronger necessarily or as strong as I need to be to keep up with these steroided out savage exactly. football, ex-football player beasts that I have to fight. So obviously I got to keep myself into shape in other ways as well. You know, complement it with some sprints or some sh- yoga classes. or So you start doing that journey. What ended up happening to me is... Uh, I discovered everything I tried after I injured my neck was failing. So whether it was yoga or lifting or running or any single thing in, you can possibly imagine out there, I tried it, even physical therapy and physio with a doctor, all that stuff, nothing worked. I would go lift, I'd be in bed for three days. I'd go to yoga, I'd be in bed for three days. Like can't move, my neck's jammed, everything. Yeah. So I started giving up. <laughs> I had to like kind of like, like 
accept that I have to retire. I'm 35 soon. Like you're not gonna, you're not, uh, you broke your neck essentially. So you have to approach this whole thing a bit differently. So through that, uh, I found functional patterns because I was at my wits end. And I like reached out to a friend in New York who's in Jiu Jitsu and he was doing it. And I was like, what is this thing you're doing it doing? Cause I want to try whatever I can. And I'm hearing that this is more of therapy than exercise. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to put you in contact with my coach. I asked the coach, is there anybody in Montreal? He went and looked, he found a guy in Montreal. We connected and now I'm doing something called functional patterns. That's a little bit new. You know, it's not, most people aren't doing it. Like I said, I had to reach out to New York to find it right. here and stuff. Right. And it is working. I'm, I'm not hurt my neck once doing it. I'm getting into way better shape. I'm having so much fun learning all the technique of it. And yeah, I feel great, better than I ever felt in my life. I mean, like watching the videos, it definitely looks at, I mean, listen, don't mind the bro science, but it definitely looks like it builds your cardiovascular, but also um, your mobility. It looks like it, it, it would help a lot with mobility. For me, like I'm a, I'm a big guy. Um, I rolled with Lambro last week. I don't know where he went. He's around here somewhere. He whooped my ass. And like, I'm a long time mixed martial arts, boxing, any combat sport I'm a fan of. And you have these preconceived, I remember I messaged you about it. Um, we, you have these preconceived notions that like, you know, oh, if... I end up in this situation, oh, I'm just going to do this and I'll be all right. I'm a, I'm a tough guy, this and that. And then you realize that, like, no, there's people out there that can literally kill you with their bare hands and mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So I'm kind of motivated now to start learning this shit. Um, but what I was saying was, you know, I'm, I'm a bigger guy for now. Um, and I'm just looking for ways to kind of really build up my VO2 max, like, as fast as possible yeah so like i, I feel like the, the stuff that you're doing like would that help with vo2 max just breathing and and lung capacity it would help keep you fit because it's exercise right, right? you're just moving movement is going to help burn calories um diet is what's going to make you skinny um the effort you put in in anything could be counterproductive if it's not the right thing which is why i won't go do a uh, bench press anymore it's just gonna hurt me or it's just not gonna give me the gains I'm looking for. Right. It's not necessary to me. What I'm doing is something that is more therapeutic than it is to keep you in shape. Okay. It's to like heal the body, it's to help your posture, it's to make your gait perfect, it's to hydrate the muscles, not with water, but like with literal shearing of the muscles and the fascia so that it can move in a connective tissue way, the way it's naturally intended, so that you don't build up, uh, build up, uh, scar on your fascia over time which is what somebody who's lifting in a up and down manner repeatedly is doing to themselves what you see me doing is something similar with more of a three-dimensional aspect to it i'm moving in the sagittal plane as well this is more a natural movement this is how humans run for tens of thousands right. of years or it's whatever. evolutionary right so i'm just mimicking our evolution more than those people are and i'm finding it's really it's intuitive it makes perfect sense it feels the next day i feel the what it's supposed to feel like it's almost uh, a euphoric sensation you look like you're enjoying it and honestly i'll be looking at some of the videos like this yeah. my body doesn't move like that yeah. bro yeah. you want to up your vo2 max just yeah. go do hill sprints really yeah yeah okay <laughs> i checked some of the videos on your I instagram you're swinging uh yeah uh, kettlebells kettlebells and stuff like that Maces, yeah. there's a video of you and you're uh it, it seems like one of those videos that you would see a UFC fighter play right before he goes out to fight. You're like, mm -hmm. I rolled on the shores of Panama. Yeah. Uh, trained on the beaches of Miami. <laughs> in the me mezzanines of Colombia and stuff like that. It seems like you're an avid traveler, my man. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely traveled uh, someplace. I mean, I've been to like China and Jamaica and Panama and Colombia and all over America. But I wish I traveled a lot more. I haven't been to Europe, for example, right? Um, no, but what I was saying in that video was I was so sweaty. I was so hot because it was some, it's, you know, I was trying to tell everybody like, I feel like quitting right now because it's so hot, but I'm not going to. I, I've been way worse. So I was just trying to let everybody know it gets way worse than what you're feeling right now. <laughs> the way you ended it was hilarious too. You're like, I'm a ginger and a Jew. Yeah, we need <laughs> and AC. And there's no AC here. We need AC. <laughs> Both those people need AC. That's in their hilarious. Life. Yeah. Yeah, hilarious. I mean, um, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention in my little intro that you're also the God Slayer. And this is this is sort of a new moniker that, that I've seen you come up with over, I think maybe over the course of the pandemic, maybe a little bit before that. Um, talk, talk to me about this whole mentality, this God Slayer mentality that you've been kind of promoting. Before I get into God Slayer, why do I do that? Why do I like, why am I Justin True Dope or God Slayer or Kingmaker, right? These alter egos. 
huh, I don't know why, to be honest, it's a personality thing. I think I'm so confident and comfortable with my own ego that I have no problem using alter egos because it's not in an egotistical manner. I'm in control of it. What I'm doing is having fun, um, trying to make like meta commentary, hyperbole, trying to like let people know like, look, <laughs> I'm an atheist, right? But I, I'm not a disrespectful version of it. I totally am like, I'll, I'll die for you to have your beliefs. You know, I, everybody's free to believe what they want. But what that means is I get to believe what I want. And I believe in the myth of the God Slayer. And you don't really have the right to disrespect that the way I don't have the right to disrespect yours. I agree. Yeah, so that's all I'm doing is I'm just letting people know, like, look, this myth serves me. Yours doesn't. I tried yours. It, it, it's not relevant to who I am. Who I am is a God Slayer. Mm. It's kind of like Chael Sonnen and his bad guy persona, you know? Yeah. One day he's Chael Sonnen, but when you talk to the bad guy, he's the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> so also, so yeah, that's the shadow. That's my dark side, the God Slayer, I guess you could say. And I don't see it that way at all. I, I see it the opposite of that. But when people view it, they're like, this God Slayer thing is dark. Kingmaker is more grounded and like lighthearted, trying to like uplift and help people, turn them into great humans. God Slayer is like, anything above me is going to die in my path. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and that's just to let you know that like I'm undeniable. I'm a little scared. I'm just going <laughs> to scooch over. And it's not me. I, I spoke to somebody last night, and they were saying, what makes you think you have the power to kill like something that's you know omni powerful or whatever? And I'm saying I don't. It's not me. I just wield the thing that can do that. The God Slayer is a sword. The sword has the power to do that. Just a vessel. And yeah, I'm just hoping it comes to me one day because I have what it takes. I'm preparing myself to wield it properly. Does like, but like, does the God Slayer, I guess, alter ego? Does it does it help you in your training at all? Because I find like for me, when I go to the gym, especially when I'm like deep into it, which will you know, again, give me a couple months, guys. I know, I don't, I know, I don't know, I. I know I don't look like I know what the fuck I'm talking about right now. Give me a couple months, though. But I find when I'm in that mode, I just I have to turn into an intense, almost aggressive human being just to get through the workout sometime. Like it's, you know, if I go in there, just my happy go lucky self, I'm not going to want to go in there and, and do the work. You know, that's what motivates me. Yeah. It motivates me to feel undeniable. So. I'm, I'm a dangerous person. I'm not a violent person. I, I'm pretty good at jujitsu. Like, uh, I'm not, I have no fear of other men, right. no matter what size or background. Right. Um, so I have this like complex where, why do you see them as a God? Like, what, what is it about this person that makes you think they're so special or godly? So if that person's in my way, I'll have to make an example out of them to you that they're just mere mortals. I don't believe in God, so I'm never going to slay a God. But I will slay anybody who's trying to uh, idolize one or pretend they are one. Or even if they're not, even if they're being humble, but the people think they are, right. oh, too bad for you. Like, this is a mistake. You're not one. So the concept of celebrity doesn't apply to you whatsoever? No. No, it doesn't. Anything, anybody who thinks they're special has to get out of my way. That's all it is. Because you're not going to get, you're not going to say you're more special than me for, you know what I mean? We're equals. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to say in, in a commentary way that if, if there's no God concept in my heart at all, even in other humans. I don't put crowns over any or halos over anyone's head. And that would, that's what motivates me is like if I'm standing across the mat looking at that guy across there and he's got a whole stadium of people going, that's the God. He's the one that kills everybody. Well, his day has been, has been met. His match has been met. I'm here to slay him. Like, I'll choke you out right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm here, to, I'm here to destroy all of your faith in this I'm, man. I'm picturing some Hercules mythological uh, demigod going after yeah. those uh, omnipresent uh, Zeus. And that, 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 not anger, but that like pretend anger you build in yourself is very motivating. Yeah, it is. Yeah, for me, it's like Mike Tyson needed a specific type of motivation. Exactly. Not all of them do. Exactly. Yeah, that was his was interesting though because he was literally hypnotized, like by by custom model to just go in there and destroy what, what whatever was in front of him, yeah, yeah, sure. and it I mean it worked arguably better than any heavyweight boxer ever in my opinion. I mean like that guy, you know, a lot of people don't remember the Tyson era. I was I was kind of a, a kid when it was coming towards its tail end, but I've studied the tape and like. It was incredible. I mean, to see that guy just destroy people, that, that leads us into a, a cool conversation since you are kind of, you know, you're very well versed in, in the combat sports world. 
I gotta get your take on this, the the, the Paul brothers and and everything going on with, with no no we're not gonna go deep into fight predictions and stuff like that. But I just like what's your take on? I guess you could just call them celebrities, for lack of a better term, getting into the combat sports world. Like, do, do you think that this is, are you one of the people on the side where, like, this is a disgrace to the sport, or are you more, like, okay with it? I have, like, Mike Tyson's opinion about it. It's that uh, these boys are going to transform the sport back to being a sport. It was in shambles. Yeah. Like, mixed martial arts, it wasn't mixed martial arts that destroyed boxing. Boxing destroyed boxing. It was Eddie Hearn. Yeah, it was bad promotion, it was uh, poor matchmaking, it was a million different things that come together to make a sport die. And that's tragic, because I was a huge boxing fan growing up, I love boxing. When you're a mixed martial artist, you love boxing. Like, it's one of your children, you know? So it's not like, oh, because I chose this, I'm disrespecting that. Not at all. Um, just like Bruce Lee loved Western boxing. It's so sad to see it die. So when you have these two guys come along, and yes, they're clowns, and they're not good fighters, and they never will be, even though I'm pretty impressed with some of the stuff they've done, let's be honest, um, uh, it's good for the sport. It's going to bring back, it's going to get all those guys who deserve to get paid, paid. Real I, kids who came from nothing. Boxing's for the guys who came from nothing, like Mike Tyson says. And if it takes some pretty little YouTube rich kid to make the sport come back, you love that guy doesn't matter what the whole narrative is about it all he's important to you and he's important to me then because you know what i mean all those boys keep going be do your antics i don't hate you you're gonna get knocked out soon really bad you think and you're not gonna, gonna do it maybe yeah i do think he's gonna do it it's and that's possible. the end of that like he, these boys aren't fighters they're just taking advantage of a charade of a sport because it always has been a bit of charade there's a lot of fake fights in boxing there's a lot of poor, like unfair matchups to begin with it was a bit of a freak show we're just watching that continue but now guys are gonna get paid and when you hear jake say people don't get paid enough thank you you can say whatever you can be act however you want you can knock out my favorite fighters do whatever you want just keep saying that yeah i agree that, he's uh, he's heavy on the pay rate and stuff like that everybody come here and you're gonna make the most money you've ever made in your life What's your take on the Triller Fight Club? Is Triller Fight Club actually something no. you enjoy watching? Or that's a disgrace. It's a shit show. Yeah. It was a that's, total shit see, show. That's, that hurt, hurts sports, yeah. the sport. Not those boys. Yeah. They're doing the right thing. They're making a storyline to sell a fight. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. But these promotions are just pure disrespect towards Warriors completely. Like I'm not going to lie, though. The Triller Fight Club, there's a fight next week. Teofimo against uh, Combosis. Okay. And uh, just the... The promo for it got me off my seat, and I was like, "Fuck, this looks, this looks interting." You know, yeah. you got Snoop Dogg at the beginning, you got yeah. Timbaland doing a bunch of shit with his <laughs> fingers, you got Remy Ma. Yeah, they're pulling out all the stops for sure. But it's a total shit show, though. I mean, like Oscar De La Hoya on commentary, clearly on oh, cocaine. Yeah, this guy's. I mean, just like look, Snoop Dogg's you know, disrespected a lot of fighters over the years, like to the point where I have a problem with him. Look, as far as commentary, when it goes to Snoop Dogg, I don't think he should be commentating on any fights because he's just, he doesn't have the right commentary for it. He's just watching something and he's literally saying some trash things and it's, it's, not, the, it's not entertaining for the viewer when you're seeing somebody that's inexperienced with what they're right. commentating on. Right. Yeah. He's one of the goats of hip-hop. Hip-hop, yes. But I'll G-check him if I ever see him. <laughs> You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it here first. <laughs> and then you'll smoke a, a nice joint with him. Yeah. <laughs> Give him a prime minister oh, pre-roll. Give him a blunt. <laughs> what, what did Tech uh, tell me? That you rolled with uh, Rogan and Eddie Bravo and stuff like that? I never got to roll with Rogan, no. No, no he's too busy, that he's guy. He's too busy. Yeah, I've crossed paths with him. I didn't roll with him. Uh, I've rolled with Eddie. How was it with Eddie? Him, he's a character and a half. He's a character and a half <laughs> when you're not rolling with him. Yeah, when you're rolling with him, he's a wizard and it hurts. <laughs> He has this crushing strength in certain positions that's like never felt that before. Even just being his uki in his seminars while he taught stuff on me, it was like, damn, this feels different than when other people do it. He's a, he's a real deal. Um, and yeah, when the seminar's done and we go and kick it outside and get high, this guy says the most wild things you can imagine. Before he was ever on a podcast, we were that was what we did. We shot the shit with Eddie Bravo before any, the world heard him. That's crazy. That's, an, uh, that's a great opportunity right there to be there at the forefront before he actually started the podcast. 
Yeah, before everybody knew him as a conspiracy theorist, we knew him as a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. Yeah, that's hilarious, man. So, um, it's, it's it's 2021. It seems like the world finally is opening up again. Um, can we expect some Dabernak events coming up? I know we talked about it earlier, but I'm excited to go to one. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I mean, it's it's something I think about almost every day. Um, we have, me and my partners have sat down and said, like, we're going to do this again. We just got to do this right. Um, we have certain, a, a few different projects that we're working on diligently right now. And if they come through, those would be perfect platforms to throw another event. So we're in the works for more events. But again, it, the times have changed. Not because of the past two years, but because the industry has changed. Like when we were doing those events, they were during Prohibition. We were on some outlaw shit. Now we're still, we're still going to push the boundaries because of just who I am. I'm just rebellious by nature, but we're going to try our best to make it so that this can continue forever in some form or fashion, because what matters most is getting these people together and networking. These people were sitting in their apartments for years alone, getting high. The whole society made them feel weird about it. And they had nowhere to, no nightlife or no community to go hang out with. I brought that here. Yeah. And for it to go away would be tragic because I actually kind of changed a lot of these people's lives in that they found their girlfriends at my events or their boyfriends or they found their crew that they go and dab with on the weekends now. And their, their quality of life improved because they found like-minded people at these events. So I want to do it for that reason. I got to come eat the five course medicated meal, man. <laughs> careful. I gotta come I back. You want to walk out of there. Be careful for real. The chocolate fountain. Oof. Yeah, it was Forget incredible. It. It's a staple at our events. And the cotton can. Oh my god, I'd leave that place looking like. Uh. I take the dab torch, like you, when you dab, you have a torch, and I I roast the marshmallow with it, and I just put it right into the fountain for the s'more, and just make dab s'mores right there. And where did the love of cooking come from? Like, where did you start cooking? I want to cook, and no, I don't cook any of it. I am an event <laughs> promoter. So, oh, you just promote and everything? Yeah, and I go the, find the chefs and everything. I, I find infusion specialists who yeah. make the best distillates and, and know how to infuse it because they're bakers themselves and this sort of stuff. And I get them to handle all that in their department. And I just plan to lay it out in front of yeah, everybody. I was going to say, uh, he's, a, he's a real catch lady. He can cook and everything. But <laughs> yeah, you know, no. I got to back up. I actually don't one. love to cook. I eat for performance, not flavor so i'm like not a great cook that's where i'm trying to get to right now with the eating because i'm um you know i'm a dopamine eater sit in front of the tv i like to eat b garbage i mean let's be honest right so i'm trying to like switch my mind to the point where it's like food now is fuel for the goal that i'm trying to attain yeah, as opposed to a, a, a pleasure reward you know it's tough I've it, tried. it is I've it's tried. hard it's I, hard i can't man I yeah, but you're skinny what i need you i need flavors you in got my a, life, you got you know a dad body you don't even have kids bro. i need flavors in my life i can't eat stuff that has no taste yeah. look i used to be the reverse i was too skinny because i had like an eating disorder from trying to cut weight for jujitsu so often i just got to the point where i was like you know what it's easier just to not eat <laughs> and so that's the reverse of what you're going through some people have it differently you know yeah. now i feel great i just eat what i want well before we wrap things up um i want to i want to put you on the spot real quick because as we mentioned before me and lambro are our esteemed cameraman shout out to lambro we uh we rolled i rolled jujitsu for the very first time in my life yeah last week and it was terrible he fucked me up all right he he tapped me three times in a row effortlessly but lambro i'm coming for your ass pause <laughs> okay not literally i mean you know whatever but i'm <laughs> I, i'm coming for you and uh I, I think jesse might help me train for this rematch this is going to be documented this journey I'll train you for it. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be a heavyweight belt. It's we'll all do, it. What we should do is we'll do EBI rules where you either start in an arm bar or on the back and you guys can like kind of fire back and forth to see who can escape faster. Yeah. And that's how you'll get them back. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm coming for you, bro. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anybody wants a free private lesson in jujitsu, you can d direct message me at Jesse Jordan Bell on Instagram. And uh, we can work out a, a day and time. You can come by TriStar, and I'll, I'll introduce you to this amazing sport. That's amazing. Uh, before we uh, let you go, Jesse, I want you to drop a gem on them. Drop a gem? Because you have to hold the gem. Is that what so we're doing? Right here, yeah, it's called it. okay, dropping okay, okay. a gem. I like it. You drop a gem. You give a piece of information, of advice to the people out there to, to make their hustle better, basically. Okay. What do you have for Wait, them? wait. He has to hold the gem. There you go, the gems right the here. Gems. This is a seance right now. <laughs> I'm going to say a line from a, a poem that I wrote about philosophy. Excellent. Once the soul has risen above the solar system, you can see the road of wisdom leads to stoicism. 
bars. That's, oh that's, that's some heavy shit. I'm going to cry. You're going to come back as a rapper next episode? <laughs> <laughs> I could always do that anytime. Yeah. He dropped a gem for us, folks. He dropped a gem. <laughs> All right. So we've reached the end of our uh, interview today. Unfortunately, we have to tell Jesse that it's time to go. We had a great time with you, my man. We got to bring you, you back. We got we to gotta try out these Dabernak events. That's for sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the Big hustle. Time. Dabernak's the Big hustle. <laughs> and I want to I make sure that Justin Trudeau puts us on the list and everything. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will. Right. For sure. You guys, if you want to check it out, you can go to YouTube and watch all the Dabernak events on video. You can add it on Instagram. And uh, we have a new website. You can go register there as a patient. And we can get, give you like special access and secret prices and locations for events and stuff in the future. Fire. Dope, dope. Well, you heard it from the man here himself. That's it for today's episode. Have a great day, everybody. Shout out to all my hustlers. It's the Hustle Podcast. Welcome, everybody. Y'all ready for this? The Hustle. My name is Steve Armopoulos, and these are my co-hosts.